Good morning. Good morning. As Henry VIII said to each of his six wives, I won't keep you very long. <laughs> well, it's Sunday morning, and on Sunday morning, some people bow their heads to pray, and some folks bow their heads to putt. <laughs> I thought I'd pray. <laughs> Dear God, so far today, I've done all right. I haven't gossiped. I haven't lost my temper. I haven't been greedy, grumpy, nasty, selfish, or overindulgent. I'm very thankful for that. But in a few minutes, God, I'm going to get out of bed. <laughs> and from then on, I'm probably going to need a lot more help. How are you? Good. That tells you that I come from the Bronx. The Bronx, it's the kind of place that when you leave it, you're not quite sure it'll be there when you go back. <laughs> However, there is a sign in a restaurant in the Bronx and it says there are only two places in the world that have the in front of them. One is the Bronx, and the other is the Vatican. <laughs> and I'm associated with both of those places. <laughs> Give or take a little bit here and there. I would like to thank Rick and Linda and the committee and uh, whoever else had a part in, in having me come to this holy place, Lincoln, Nebraska, to share my experience, strength, and hope with you. It's an honor and a, a privilege to, to be in your beautiful presence. I cannot help but be impressed at the blessing and holiness that, that sits before me. It's nice to be invited. There was a time in my life when people stopped inviting me. I used to go anyway. <laughs> And then I made a 30-day retreat wondering why they didn't invite me back. So indeed, it's an honor and a privilege uh, to be invited. Someone asked me, um, when you get up to speak, are you, are you nervous? And I said, sure, it's always throw-up time for me. And someone else said to me, you know, worry when it isn't. And I said, that's right. But in talking about being nervous, I'm reminded of the, the young priest. He was going to give his first sermon and he was very nervous about the whole thing and one of the other priests said to him why don't you ask that old priest over there father michael he, he was a great speaker and he'll give you some techniques so the young priest went over and he asked father michael and father michael said sure he said the best thing to do is start with a line that is going to grab their attention for example he said say something like some of my best years was spent in the arms of a woman. Well, the young priest stood with his mouth open. He, he couldn't believe that this is what was coming out of the old fellow's mouth. And the old priest smiled and he said, she was my mother. <laughs> well, next Sunday came and the young priest got up and he's hanging on to the, to the podium and uh, he's about to give his uh, sermon and, and he's so nervous and he says, some of the best years of my life was spent in the arms of a woman. But for the life of me, I can't remember who she was. <laughs> I stand in awe on this, the most important day of my life. I stand in awe of God's love for me. I stand in awe of you and my relationship with you. And I stand in awe of Maurice. If you don't remember anything that I share today, please remember this, because this is how I want to be remembered since it's the most important thing about me. I'm an alcoholic. 
I'm a woman. I'm a member of a religious community. I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous in good standing. In particular, the Forest Hills group in Queens, New York. That's my home group. I have a marvelous and wonderful family, what's left of them. I have a beautiful community of sisters. I have wonderful friends both in and out of the fellowship. I just love saying I have a home group. And the Forest Hills group is my home group. And the last thing I always tell you about myself is my name. Incidentally, my name is Sister Maurice. One of the things that I'm partial to in our fellowship is that it's a fellowship of equals. There are no titles in Alcoholics Anonymous. No one really cares what you do for a living. I like all of that. I may be prejudiced about us, but I don't think there's another group in society that can claim fellowship of equals like we can. No titles. You have never been anything else in our fellowship other than Sister Maurice. Now, isn't that a title? Well, for me, it's my name. It's a name I've been using most of my life. It's on all my important papers. It's on my driver's license. It's written up quite well in two police stations in the city of New York. <laughs> but moreover, it's the name that I gave to you when I came into your beautiful presence a while back now. A call had been made for me, and I was to go to the Forest Hills group of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I really wasn't quite sure that someone of my class and caliber should be going to such a place as AA. So I was not a, ha a happy camper when I came. Little by slowly, that has all changed for me. So much so that I can say quite comfortably today, I choose to live the AA way of life. For years I said, I have to go to AA, I better go to AA, I gotta go to AA. I don't have to better or gotta. I choose to live the AA way of life. And when I talk about something being a way of life, it's not an incidental experience. It's not something I do when the spirit moves me. A way of life to me is as much a part of me as my right hand and my left hand. But for starters, I went to this first meeting and I was supposed to meet a gal there. And I went into a small room and there was only one fellow in the room and he took a look at me and he came running across the room and he grabbed my hand and he gave me a handshake like I hadn't had in quite a while. He told me who he was and he said, what's your name? I said, me? He said, yeah, what's your name? Well, I said, I'm Sister Maurice. And this fellow didn't say to me, your mother doesn't call you that, does she? <laughs> and he didn't say to me, well, we're going to have a group conscience meeting and I'll get back to you about that one. <laughs> the very next thing the man said was, hi, Sister Maurice. You're welcome. And in my over 27 years with you a day at a time, no one has even suggested that I call myself anything else. So I've never been anything else in our fellowship other than Sister Maurice. The name is important, but the most important thing about me at any point on a clock is what I told you first and foremost, that I am an alcoholic. And each and every time I say that, beginning first, when I awaken in the morning, I don't know how you awaken in the morning, but I sleep on my right side for the most part. And my eye, my right eye is buried in the pillow. So I kind of wake up like this. See, this eye's open. And I know I'm still here. And the very first thing I do is announce before my God, I am an alcoholic. I choose to enter into my day by announcing before my God the most important thing about me. I am an alcoholic. It puts me on the right wavelength up here. I hope and I pray and I do what's necessary thus far so that I don't reach a point in recovery where my attitude would be, well, of course I'm an alcoholic. I've been one of those for years now. So I choose to enter into my day by announcing before my God, I am an alcoholic. And any time during the course of any given day that I say that, I'm reminded that of all the things I do each day that God gives me, my most important work, job, assignment is to stay sober. And I do that best through the principles and traditions of Alcoholics Anonymous as they have been written. When I came to you a while back, you gave me a book and you called it big. I thought it was an interesting way that you described the book. 
I had cleared up enough to see that it wasn't a small book. It was a big book. The gal who gave it to me, she was much shorter than I was, and the book was so big, she held it in two hands, and she said, here is a big book. <laughs> no coincidence, at that moment, some fellows were putting some signs on the wall, and I'm very far-sighted, and I caught the sign that said, keep it simple. And I was able to make a connection. I said to myself, wouldn't dare say it to her, I said to myself, wow, do these people practice what they preach? Because you can't get much simpler than that. Here is a big book. Of course, now we have the paperback, which I call the small big book. And I do that purposely. Because, you know, there is another book out in the bookstores. It's called The Small Book. And it talks about being an alternative to Alcoholics Anonymous. So I call ours The Small Big Book. Well, you know, you introduce anything new in AA and they send for you. <laughs> and this fellow came to me one night. He had a small big book. I thought he was going to pay me a compliment. And then I saw how upset he was. And he said, hey, sister, you call this The Small Big Book. I said, I do. He said, that's a contradiction. I said, what do you mean, contradiction? He said, small, big, small, big. <laughs> I said, well, we have had jumbo shrimp for years. <laughs> well, I took the book from you, the one that you called big, and this is what you said to me. You told me I should read the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. I should study the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. I should believe what I found there. I should share what I believe. And I should practice what I share. And then you added another piece. You told me I should do that along with the people who know how to do it best. And you called that group the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. And then you put all of that together and you said, that is a design for living that really works. Well, what did I know about anything? I said, well, I'll see what I can do. And do you know that design for living has worked so well for this lady here that I don't spend a fleeting moment of my precious time looking for alternative ways to go. I need all the help I can get, but it's always after that design for living. You know, the little sheep that strays from the flock, perhaps you know some little sheep. You know the little sheep that says, oh, I know I've been missing meetings, but don't worry about me, life is great. You know the little sheep who says, oh, I know you're concerned about me. You were so helpful to me when I first came around. You know, the little sheep that strays from the flock is usually the one that's found in the ditch, over the embankment, and hanging from the barbed wire fence. I have a drunk -a log that would tell you quite well that all by myself, I can stay very sick and quite drunk but I truly believe I cannot stay sober and fairly well without you. My most favorite fruit is the banana. And last night, close to midnight, I had a banana because it was in the beautiful basket of fruit that was up in my room. And every time I have a banana, whether I take the banana off the bunch or whether I get to the dish and there's only one banana left, or whether I'm out in a restaurant and I have some cereal and a sliced banana. Whenever I eat a banana, I have a meditation. And the meditation I have is that the banana that leaves the bunch is the one that gets skinned. <laughs> Now, if you didn't get that, you could talk to your sponsor. <laughs> and
And if you don't have a sponsor, well, you know the rest of the story. <laughs> Alcohol became a way of life for me in a very short period of time. It dictated my moods, it made my decisions, it said you will and it said you won't. I found it hard to eventually surrender to that when the first drink of alcohol went into this body, mind and spirit, I was put in a position where I could no longer tell you how many I was going to have. I couldn't tell you what my behavior was going to be like. However, if you asked me in those days, how many did you have? I would have said two, because that's what a lady should have. And if you said to me, and what was your behavior like? I would have said, steady as you go, because that's how I saw myself. The most fascinating thing I have learned about the disease of alcoholism is that it's that first drink. I was a first grade teacher at the time, and I would be working very hard with my children at 10 o'clock in the morning. And something would start in my body, mind, and spirit. And it wouldn't be saying, don't you have to go out to the bathroom? Don't you need a cup of coffee? It would be screaming in there. You need a drink. And the very next thing I would do would be to put up against that screaming what people told me I had so much of, and that was willpower. And the willpower approach was futile. And I went on to learn that it wasn't that I was a weak-willed individual, but rather I was a sick, untreated alcoholic, a diseased person. And so morning after morning after morning, in the classroom, I'd move to the next game plan. And I would say, well, it's a couple of minutes after 10. These kids can go out to the bathroom. They can have their snack. I'll get the teacher next door to keep an eye on them. I'll go over to the convent, get a drink, and be back when this is all over. And I'd be running across the yard to the convent, and this would be my thinking. This is going to be my last drink, at least until I've done my day's work. I was too sick to recall in those days that at 5 a.m., when the big bell went off to get us into our day, uh, my story goes back to old God's time uh, before we went mod, and uh, <laughs> we had this big bell that went off at 5 a.m., and for me to get into anything in those days, I had to reach over from my bed and take that drink. And each and every time I took it, I said, this is going to be the last one at least until I've done my day's work. And so after I would take that first one, I was put in a position where I had no say in how many more I was going to have. And everything began to center around, when am I going to get that next one? And yet, in those days, if you met me along the street and you said, Sister, could I ask you a question? Who or what is the center of your life? I would have been insulted by the question. I mean, you just called me sister. You see how I'm dressed, every piece from stem to stern. You just saw me come out of that building called convent, and you're asking me who's the center of my life. How come you don't know that the center of my life is God? And I would have been insulted by your question. Today, I choose to live honestly, thanks to you. You know, I knew a lot about honesty before I met you. In fact, I was in a position of teaching little children how to be honest and then instructing those little children to go home and help mommy and daddy be honest. You know, it's one thing to know a lot about something. It's another thing to pass it on to the whole world. But what about having it in your own life? And you know, for a time there, honesty was on the back burner. But today, I choose to live honestly, and I have no problem in sharing with you that somewhere along the journey, the focus shifted for me, and it shifted from God to that next drink. And I justified the use of alcohol in my life. I might say, too, because maybe someone here needs to hear it. It was not one of my goals in life to become an alcoholic. I don't recall getting up a dark and gloomy day, a bright and sunny day, saying, today's the day, Alki, by six tonight, watch me. <laughs> I'll destroy me and see how many I can take with me. I do not see alcoholism as self-inflicted. That's my opinion. I believe it's a sickness that comes to a person. I think it's a marvelous and wonderful idea that we have steps that suggest to us in God's time that we make amends because we are accountable. 
And I think that's a marvelous and wonderful idea. But I don't hold myself responsible for the sickness that came to me. However, I do hold myself very, very responsible for the life-giving precious gift of sobriety that has been given to me. I did not get sober. I tried to get sober. I wasn't able to pull it off. I don't believe a person can get sober. That's my opinion. I believe something bigger, greater outside of that person takes place. They call it a miracle. And I believe the precious life-giving gift of sobriety is given. And it's given by one bigger, greater than all of us put together. I choose to call that one God. And so I feel very responsible to take care of that precious life-giving gift of sobriety each day that God gives me. So much so that I have no problem in sharing with you. If you should ever hear that Maurice is back drinking, please, please, don't call me a victim. Call me a volunteer. And the very next thing you say about me, somewhere along the line, she wasn't willing to do everything necessary to stay sober. I cannot plead ignorance today. You have taught me and taught me well how to take care of that precious life-giving gift of sobriety each day that God gives me. Going back to the scene in the bed, you know, my eyes in the pillow there, you know. The second thing I do is pray the Lord's Prayer. And when I reach the part of the prayer that says, give us this day our daily bread, he will not refuse anyone who asks for the bread. He will give sufficient for the day, I believe. It is my responsibility then to take that bread and to use it to take care of that precious life-giving gift of sobriety through that design for living each day that he gives me. I was affected physically, mentally, spiritually, socially, and emotionally from this disease. Physically, I fared out pretty well, as far as we know. But you know, there were times that I tried to arrange my own physical death. I used to take the car, leave the Bronx, go across the George Washington Bridge, and up the Palisades Parkway. And I would pull over where you could sightsee. And I would say, when those cars are gone, when those kids are gone, I'm going to run this car over the embankment because I don't know what's the matter with me. And then you know what would happen? I would have what I call a moment of amazing grace. And I'd say to myself, I'll go get a drink. I'll come back another time. So I was not to die physically. But you know, there are other ways of dying. I'm sure you can identify. I suffered the death of my values. I suffered the death of my integrity. I suffered the death of everything I stood for as a woman and everything I stood for as a sister. All those areas of my life died. Outwardly, I looked pretty good, held a job, did it fairly well, tried to keep up with my responsibilities. And above all, during this time, above all, I always said my prayers. And many of you have shared with me along the journey that you thought you missed the boat because you didn't pray enough. Listen, I prayed enough for you and all belonging to you. <laughs> so this disease must be so big, and indeed it is, that something as powerful as prayer will not take it away. I don't believe you can just pray your way through your alcoholism. And yet we say, where would we be without prayer? Prayer is a path where there is none. When all else fails, have I prayed? But I think there's another piece that goes with the prayer for people like you and me. Pray and row the boat. And this beautiful design for living enables us to do that, to pray and to row the boat. Well, I denied that alcohol was my problem. And I was somewhat relieved when I learned that denial is the major presenting symptom of alcoholism. And when you're in denial from this disease, you are not in touch with reality. What I knew about my drinking would fit on a postage stamp. What was happening in my life was as big as the state of Nebraska. But if I didn't have it up here, when it was presented to me, then it didn't happen. And it would be a good idea if you went and took care of your own laundry. 
Now, once in a while, I meet someone who says, you know, nobody really ever talked to me about my drinking. Oh, I can't say that. Hundreds of people talk to me about mine. Some of them came from Europe just to talk to me about my drinking. Some of them wanted to be martyrs at an early age. The nerve of that one to come in here and talk to me about my drinking and the behavior that went with it. And there were many times that I exercised the denial. You know, I could come here today and I could tell you what it's like in recovery today. And you could say, well, you know, eh, it's pretty much the same for me. Yeah, I follow the design, I do. You might find yourself saying, I wonder if she ever felt like I felt. I wonder if she ever did any of the things that I did. See, so I like to tell you what happened. In regard to denial, my mother was in the hospital having a total hip operation. And she was there quite a while. The operation wasn't as perfected way back then as it is today. And I went every day to be at my mother's bedside because that's where a good daughter should be. And how do we affect the people on the other side of the coin? My beautiful mother would say to me, if you don't come tomorrow, it'll be just fine. You must have lots of work to do around the convent and the school. Not being in touch with reality, my thinking was, wow, there she is with all her pain, and she's thinking of me. <laughs> my beautiful mother could not bring herself to say, you're an embarrassment to me. You are no help to me. I don't need you around this hospital drunk. Well, I have just one sister, and she's also a sister, a member of my own community. And during my act of alcoholism, my sister secretly wished she had joined a missionary community and lived in South America. <laughs> it's very hard to be proud of a sick, untreated alcoholic. I know that today. I didn't know it then. So my sister came to the hospital to visit my mother. She gave me a little wink to come outside. I dutifully went outside. She's very, very tall, seven years younger, than myself, but very tall. And she put her finger like this. You know how they do it. And she said, why? Why would you come to this hospital at 4 o'clock in the afternoon drinking? I was just about to give a lecture when it dawned on me. I don't have to say anything. We've been down this road a hundred times before. To the best of my recollection, not a word did I speak. But being a typical alcoholic, and that's all that I am, is a typical alcoholic, I'm sure you can identify with the song as I can. You know the song, first you say you will and then you won't, you know? You've made up your mind you're not going to say anything, but you're going to put something on the record. <laughs> so I took my right hand, which was the more powerful of my two, and I belted her. <laughs> Shortly thereafter, two nurses came running down the hall and they are yelling, sisters, sisters. Now, they weren't calling us sisters because we were the duty girls. <laughs> but we were dressed very much like sisters used to dress. Some still dress today. My veil was on the floor. Hers was someplace else. <laughs> I can see people are starting to gather. <laughs> this is the famous hospital for special surgery in New York City. People come from all over the world to that hospital. One of their major rules is that no one leaves their bedrooms unescorted. These people were coming out crutches, wheelchairs, <laughs> all fours. Because the word got around very quickly that there were two nuns out there killing one another. <laughs> now, in the midst of all this chaos, I have a couple of thoughts going on in this head up here. Interesting. I did not have the thought, maybe I shouldn't have belted her. <laughs> and I didn't have the thought, maybe I shouldn't have had that last drink before I came down here. Uppermost in my mind, right here, I'm looking at her, and I'm saying to myself, why did she scream? <laughs> I look back with a sober, clear head today, and, uh, you know, it's kind of normal. Someone gives you a belt and you let out a hoot. <laughs> But see, I wasn't in touch with reality. <laughs> the other thought I had was my purse had fallen onto the floor, making a rather loud sound as it fell to the floor. I was a little distracted with the purse, you know. Uh, but I managed to get it over here 
uh, by my feet, and uh, when I could steady as you go, I was going to bend down and pick it up. Now, I wasn't too concerned about the few dollars in the purse. I have a vow of poverty. I kept it quite well during this time. <laughs> but I was very concerned about the pint of holy water in the purse. <laughs> One pint of Christian Brothers branding. And what is that all about? That's nothing more than the thinking of a sick, untreated alcoholic. Now, there's only one word to describe somebody who'd be in the position that I was in. Oh, I had to go through a lot of other descriptions. And if there's anyone here today who still sees themselves in this first group, I would suggest you leave that thinking here because it doesn't apply. I had to go through bad, hopeless, weak-willed, sinner, you should know better. I beat myself unmercifully with you should know better. But the way I would describe someone today who'd be in the position that I was in would be sick, unwell, not playing with full deck. (laughs) That's respectful. Or I heard a fellow one night, he described himself, he said he was a quart low. (laughs) I heard another fellow another night, he said he had a photogenic mind. He just never had any film in the camera. before I could see myself as sick and unwell. If you drink and you drive, you might miss the mark. It was an insult to show on your face that you were thinking of driving us home. I brought you there, I bring you home. My first accident, in July of 70, my good friend, Sister Rose, was in court over the dismissal of a teacher from her school. This was a big to-do in the diocese at that time. Now, Rose had a lawyer appointed by the diocese. And I said, who knows more about this case than I do? I'll be in the court to help the lawyer help Rose. How do we affect the people on the other side of the coin? The night before the trial, Rose called me up and she said, Maurice, please don't come to court. Not being in touch with reality, my thinking was, wow, there she is with all her pain and she's thinking of me. (laughs) Well, I have heard Rose share her story in that marvelous and wonderful program that parallels ours, that of Al-Anon, and indeed Rose was thinking of herself, and rightly so. It was not my style to push. I said, you know, you're right. You'll have a lot of paperwork to do. I'll meet you downtown lunchtime. I'll take you to lunch. You'll brief me, and I'll advise you for the afternoon session. And to be rid of me, she said, fine. Well, I was in graduate school that summer, and I drove, well fortified, from the very top of New York City, the very top of the Bronx, to the very bottom of the city, the Wall Street section of my city. It was five minutes after 12 lunchtime, a working day in Wall Street, and the weather was clear. Those are the things they tell you at the top of the police report. (laughs) A United States mail truck that was parked by the curb, minding its own business, got in my way and I smashed into it. And when the policeman came on the driver's side, first word out of his mouth, you couldn't miss it, he said, sister. I was a little taken back by the next piece. I mean, he didn't even say, are you hurt? Could I call someone? You think you could have been my first grade teacher? He said, sister, could you have been drinking? Well, I am a great fan of New York's finest. And for a fleeting moment, I wondered how this guy got on the police force with a question like that. As was my style, officer, let me help you. I proceeded to tell the officer about my friend who was down here being persecuted and how upset I was, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I went into a blackout, eventually a pass out, as was my custom. I woke up in a convent a short distance away. I didn't know I was in a convent. I didn't know where I was. I woke up in this strange bed, half my clothes on, half my clothes off. I didn't know where I was. Believe you me, it was not my custom then certainly not my custom today, to wake up in strange beds. (laughs) But I'm around long enough to know that you have your story. (laughs) (laughs) However, at a time like that, we all have the same tricks of the trade. Where am I, what happened, and how do you get out of here? (laughs) I put that game plan into operation, and I could see a partially open door, and I could hear some voices. 
So I tiptoe over. Now, I don't know, maybe it was your style. It certainly wasn't my style to throw the door open and say, what happened? <laughs> so you tiptoe over and you hang one ear out, see if you could get a little something to go on, because you know from nothing, and you do know that they're going to be asking you questions. So you have this ear out. Well, I get to the door. The ear is out. I can see Rose, so I knew everything was going to be okay if Rose was there. There was another sister, a big, tall lady. Neither of us knew her. She was beating up Rose. Oh, she was screaming at Rose. And I got to the door with the ear out as the big, tall lady said to Rose, she said, your friend is on pills or she's drinking. And in order to help her, you are going to have to hurt her. Oh, I thought that was such poor advice. <laughs> Oh, I took my ear in and I went back to bed to get a little rest to handle Rose who came in and asked the going question in our lives at that time. What happened? I told it as I saw it. I lost control of the car because I was so upset about the court case. Now, in those days, the car was in my mother's name. I had the car fixed back out on the road. Three weeks had passed. I thought we were getting on with our lives and saving the world. Every time he talked to Rose, she had this question. When are we going to tell your mother about the accident? Never. Why do you want to tell my mother about the accident? Well, the car's in her name. So what? The car's fixed. Then the fears that set in for a sick, untreated alcoholic. What if Rose tells your mother? So I called Rose up, invited her out for supper, my treat, took her to a little restaurant, leaned across the table in the restaurant and said, if you dare to tell my mother about the accident, Someday you will come out of your convent. I will be sitting in a car. And when you cross the street, that will be it. <laughs> that is called threatening someone's life. <laughs> now, I always share that in my story. And one night, 100 years ago, that means a long time, I was speaking someplace, and we had a friend of ours at the meeting. She's not in program. And at the end, I noticed there was some commotion. And she was pushing everybody aside. She said, I have to get to Maurice. I said, what's the matter with you? She said, do you really think you would have run over, Rose? <laughs> so my head kind of jerked back. I, you know, no one, no one had ever asked me that question before. Not even Rose. <laughs> I said, let me tell it to you this way. Of myself, no. I wouldn't hurt a fly. Without a drink in me, you never knew I was around. As a little kid... Well into adulthood, I was always hiding out. I was like part of the woodwork, part of the drapes. What did I have to offer? What was I anyway? You know, life comes from the inside out. I used to describe it as I was deprived. No, no, I don't believe we're deprived. But because of our history and our story, we're not able to get in touch with all that God has given. So it's very dark in there. And then you put one drink in here. Just one. And you can paint the most tragic picture you can think of. And I could be the one heading it up. And I always like to point out that it wasn't that I was at Mass the next morning or that I was reading one of my 10,000 religious books that I had at that time. And the thought came to me, oh, you shouldn't kill Rose. <laughs> you know what happened? It was another moment of that amazing grace. It just wasn't to be part of my story or part of Rose's that I would run her over. Well, the disease was progressing rapidly, and one day I got a call from my boss. Now, this was the big boss, the head of my community. The call was in the same category as if the Pope said, get yourself to Rome. This was a big call. And there were only two reasons in those days why you would get this kind of a call. One, you were in trouble, or there was a special assignment that only you could do. So I'm driving up to see the boss, and this is my thinking. I have enough to do. <laughs> Why are they always asking me? 
So we get there, we have a little chit-chat. She says, Maurice, I'll get to the point. Some of the sisters are saying that you drink too much. There's nobody there but the two of us. In those days when the big boss spoke, you didn't ask questions. I asked a question. I, I stuttered when I asked it. I said, where are they? She said, oh, they don't want to be mentioned. I said to myself, And you know, in a very sick and negative way, I wouldn't recommend it to anyone. I was into one of our steps at that moment. Made a list. (laughs) Of all people who had harmed me. And asked God to be rid of them. And I sat there writing one contract after another. I figured I'd ask another question. I said, do you really know anything about me? Of course, in those days, you know, there was this big gap from the big boss and the rest of us. We had bosses in between that we dealt with. Well, she said, I have a file. So she went over and she took out a folder and she peeked in and she said, oh, I didn't know you were doing this in the diocese. And she said, oh, you're going to get your master's degree. And, oh, you started the reading program. Well, the trophies were all over the place. She closed the folder and she said, you know, Maurice, I will never, ever again believe this about any of our sisters. I said, that's a good policy to follow. She gave me an apology and off I went. And as I walked back to the car, I had only one thought. She will never, ever send for me again. She never did. Next time she arrived unannounced and put me away. (laughs) So when I learned about this denial and not being in touch with reality, it helped me. I was angry and resentful during this time. Angry with God. I'd given my life to God. What do you want from me? I love the word relationship. And I learned about relationships from you. You've been my teachers about relationships. Prior to recovery, relating to God, whoever, whatever he was. You know how I did it? Since I was a little kid and well into adulthood, I sat up straight and I disciplined myself and I knelt up straight and I was always looking for another religious book and and more techniques for prayer and meditation, you know. I started as a little kid, right into adulthood with that, right into the convent with that. And, you know, after I attempted a relationship with God, you know the expression that would have applied? We didn't have it in those days. But do you know what the expression would have been? Been there, done that. You see? And then when I was drinking, it was taking God on. Well, if you don't need me, Well, I don't need you. And if I don't need someone bigger, greater outside of this lady here, I wonder who I think I am. And so I was angry and resentful with God. I was depressed during this time. I was in the convent many years before I picked up my first drink. I didn't like the taste of alcohol. I didn't use alcohol. In 1967, on the 5th of January, my beautiful father... Maurice, he died. He went to God. He died of alcoholism. I believe that was the secondary cause of my father's death. I had tried to help my father. And after my father went to God, I went way inside. And I came out in a short time with a drink in my hand. And shortly thereafter, my mother said to me one day, she said, you know, while we have you, your father is not gone. And I know today, and I walk very tall with this, that we were carbon copies of one another. With one big difference, the way we were to receive the precious gift of sobriety. You see, my father received sobriety when he looked eyeball to eyeball into the eyes of God upon his death. I believe at that moment is perfection. And whatever you are lacking, you receive at that time. And so I went into depression after my father's death, picked up my first drink. And of course, as we say, drinking alcohol while depressed adds misery to misfortune. And then the bargaining stage. I did a lot of bargains. I did them all with God. One bargain I like to share on. I got into bed one night, rosary beads in one hand, always had my prayer beads, hanging on to my sheets with the other hand. And I'm no sooner in the bed when I feel I have to get up and get a drink. And I said to God, I don't want to drink anymore tonight. Please help me. 
I'll do more work for you and for your people. Please don't let me drink tonight. Well, you know, the first drink of the day always has the final say. And of course, we've had that. So the rosary beads go to the floor and the covers get pushed back and you get up out of the bed and you crawl along, you get your hiding spot, and you get your bottle. And I took another drink, something I didn't want to do. And you know, on that particular night, it was one of the few nights that I didn't go into a blackout right away. After I took that drink, I beat that floor and I doubted the existence of God. How could a God who loved me a God that I was to relate to as father. How could you allow me to be in that condition? I just asked you to help me. I'll bet there's no God. I live in downtown Manhattan, right in the heart of New York City. And when I'm in town, I drive on the East River Drive, the FDR Drive. And I see our brothers and sisters yours and mine. I see them on both sides of the highway. They build their homes there. They build them out of cardboard boxes and plastic bags. And they need a meal. They need a, a pair of shoes, a pair of socks, a pants. And they have little brown bags. They have one brown bag like I used to have. And they have other brown bags sometimes. And you know, if those folks went over to the guardrail on the FDR and beat the guardrail and doubted the existence of God, we'd say, poor socks, what they got going for them. I'm in a beautiful convent. I want for nothing. And alcohol brought me to the point where I doubted the existence of God. As we say in here, whether you come from Yale or jail, Park Avenue, Park bench. What does it matter? I think it's very important to know your story, your history. But I'm more concerned with where do we go from here? Because, you know, with each new breath, we begin again. And the other thing I did that same night, I cried out at the top of my lungs. Isn't there anybody anywhere who knows what I'm going through? Because each one in the throes of the sickness thinks nobody, nobody knows what I'm going through. Well, I didn't know you were up the street and around the corner and across the, the road and a few miles away and out here going through the same thing. But I'm mighty glad that somewhere along our journey, God saw fit that we would find one another in this beautiful fellowship. C.S. Lewis, you've heard of him. He says in one of his writings about relationships, he talks about relationships in general. And he says it's as if God says to the people in the relationship, you have not chosen one another, but I, God, have chosen you for one another. If you think of the relationships that you have in this fellowship, would you of yourself have chosen those people? I like to think it was all arranged. We can go back to the gatehouse in Akron, Ohio. And time was running out for Bill Wilson, so it seemed. And Dr. Bob came. You have not chosen one another, but I, God, have chosen you for one another. Well, today, I make bargains, deals, promises, and commitments, and I follow through. I attribute that to one fact and one fact only. I don't drink alcohol while I'm sober. Very significant in Maurice's life. <laughs> and the final stage is acceptance. The disease was progressing rapidly, and finally, it all came to a head. I had a lot of do-gooders in my life, people who talked to me about my situation. I had two exceptional do-gooders, my sister and Rose. And keeping it very simple, they snitched. 
they blew the whistle and they turned me in to the same boss that I had won over some time before. And they brought the boss to my mother's where I was hiding out. And things started to move rapidly. I noticed a marked change in the boss. She was very gentle with me, but she wasn't interested in anything I had to say. And she spoke in past tense. She said, arrangements have been made. (laughs) And they're expecting you in Lutheran General Hospital in Park Ridge, Illinois. And she said, you could go Friday or Saturday. I figured I'd be dead by Saturday. I said, I'll go Saturday. She said, you'll be there for 28 days. And I said to myself, not me. And she said, you'll find out what's wrong with you. And I said to myself, nothing wrong with me. But I knew the only way I was going to get out of that room was to say I would go. Oh, I said, I'll go. So I went out on an AA plane, American Airlines. (laughs) And there I met you. There were 64 patients, male and female. And the word got around very quickly that we had a Catholic sister in treatment. And one by one, you came to me. And the first thing you did was you beat up on yourself, said terrible things about yourself, but you always finished up by saying, you know, sister, you're not like me. Well, now, anyone who thinks like I do is going to be my friend. And I said, maybe I can stay and help these people. (laughs) I'm not one to sit around idle. By the end of the first week, I was a therapist. (laughs) And the word got around quickly. If you don't understand it in group, you don't like your counselor, You talk to that sister. She knows everything about everything. (laughs) Now, we had one free hour at 1 o'clock every day. Well, you know, they tell you, big thing on the schedule, free time. Then they tell you what to do with it. (laughs) And we were supposed to stay in our rooms, read, write, listen to tapes. I always did as I was told. Since I was this high, well into adulthood, somebody said jump, I jumped. Somebody said stop jumping, I stopped jumping. I talk about compartments. I didn't know that there was a compartment in here given by God. You don't acquire it. It's given by God. Power of choice. I had never gotten in touch with my compartment. I always did what everybody told me to do. So I'm in the room. You're supposed to set up your table, have your tape recorder, do your writings. There I was every day at 1 o'clock. I'd be there two minutes, and something would come over of me. And I would get up, and I would take the table, and I would pitch it across the room. Then I'd go to the wall, bang my head on the wall, yelling and screaming at God, why me? I've been so good, and this is what you've done to me. And sometimes there'd be blood pouring out of my head. My roommate would run out, and she'd say, she's at it again. They'd come in, they'd clean me up, calm me down. They were very gentle with me. They'd help me pick up the table. They'd get me another recorder. And I'd pick up my pen, and I'd go on about my work until the next day. You know, I was too sick at that time. And long before that time, I go back as a little kid, well into adulthood. I was too sick to hear God say, you don't have to be good. You are good. You don't have to be good. You are good. That's a given. That's in the clay itself. I cannot help but be impressed at the goodness that sits before me. But where does bad come in? Oh, that's behavior. That's attitude. I separate that from the person, and I continue to chip away at mine to this marvelous and wonderful design for living. But while the process continues, I walk very tall. When I say to someone, how are you? And they say, good. Many times I say, well, tell me something else. I knew that before I asked you. You don't have to be good. You are good. I don't know any bad folks. I believe there is a serious unwellness. 
I go so far as to say some people should be indoors and monitored. We should know where they are. <laughs> you don't have to be good. You are good. What I do is not who I am. You helped me a day at a time to get in touch with that. Well, some 27 years later and then some, I have the same question of God. Why me? Not why me, why am I an alky, but why me, why am I sober, since most people don't receive this gift. And the last time I asked him was after I left the beautiful people at the breakfast table and I went upstairs to my room and I said to God, tell me one more time, why me? Why am I sober since most people don't receive this gift? And he answers very loud and very clear. And he says the same thing to me all the time. He says, Maurice, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. You see, the book says, the big one, or the small big one, God did for him what he could not do for himself. And he says, many are called to the disease of alcoholism. Very few, a drop in the bucket, are chosen for the precious life-giving gift of sobriety. And I say, well, why me? And he says, well, make your little chart. I make a little chart. I headed alcoholism. I put a simple line down the center. I put on this side of the chart, all of us in recovery. There'll be standing room only if you go to Minneapolis a day at a time next year. But if we put on this side of the chart, those who are still out there, you wouldn't even see us. I find it awesome to be on that side of the chart. And I don't want to lose touch with that. I don't want to go through the motions of, yeah, I'm an alcoholic, then a year. And so I ask him, and it keeps me energized. Why me, God? Why am I sober? So I'm on that side of the chart. I say, well, why, God? Why am I on that side of the chart? And he says, Maurice, how do you see death? A hundred years ago now, that means a long time, I sat with death. I found it so negative, And I cannot afford to think negative. And I had some writings and I had some tapes and I was praying and I read a line that I had read many times before. But you know what happened for me? It was another moment of that amazing grace. And the line was, there's a time to be born and there's a time to die. And I believe that's on God's calendar. And I believe a person goes to God in death whether they're two, 22, or 102, whether they die in their sleep, AIDS, alcoholism, shooting, explosion, cancer, we're all dying of something. And I believe the death will come about when the work is finished. I cannot believe that my God stands or sits any place and says, well, I'm taking that father, I'm taking that child, I'm taking that friend. God does not operate that way. But your work is finished. We may have more work for those folks to do, but on God's calendar, the work is finished. That helps me. The point. The people on this side of the chart, the 2.5 million, I believe, that we are. Well, we have a disease that kills most people. Most people do not survive alcoholism. It's an ultimate terminal condition, and here we are. Well, our debt's been interrupted, I believe. Because our work's not finished. There'll be tragedy in our world today, isn't there always? Some people will go to God, their work is finished. Others will be saved, their work is not finished. I don't know what their work is, those who are saved. I believe ours is defined. It's to carry a message. It's to walk with. It's to pass it on. It's to be that important part of that design for living, the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. 
And you know, it seems like a contradiction at times. A bunch of folks where it's been said to us, go away, get lost, who needs you, you're here again. And look at the assignment that is ours. Helps me to walk very tall today. And you know, there are many ways to carry a message. Pontificating at a podium is only one way to carry a message. I got off the plane last night in Omaha and I looked around and God said, it's a program of attraction rather than promotion. Keep looking around. And then my eyes met Rick's and his eyes met mine. And we knew one another, you see. We were a program of attraction rather than promotion. That's what I saw, you see. And so very late in the fourth week, I came to grips with this. Not the way I see it today, but choking on it, I was saying, well, I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> and I left the facility with a prescription to go to Alcoholics Anonymous and these words from my counselor. He said, if you're faithful to the prescription of Alcoholics Anonymous, you will only have to return here as our guest. I said, I won't make you any promises. I'll see what I can do. And by the grace of God, that amazing grace of God, and faithfulness to that design for living a day at a time, I haven't found it necessary to pick up a drink or any substitute since that April 17th, 1971. Thank you. I'm not one who says I will never drink again. If I thought I would never drink again, perhaps I wouldn't be as faithful. Early this morning, I asked for daily bread. I do not have tomorrow's bread. There are advantages to years of sobriety. I've had them. But as the years of sobriety increase, so do the perils of smugness. And every so often, as part of my inventory, I ask my God, does it just seem in the eyes of the world that I am a recovering alcoholic? Or am I a recovering alcoholic? And so I came in to Alcoholics Anonymous and I did the old one too. I went to meetings and I didn't drink and I didn't drink and I went to meetings. And I could always be found in the third row, all hunched over, waiting for this event to be finished so I could go home. But they weren't going to say that I wasn't there. And one night I heard a speaker share, and it was like a shot in the arm to me. He said that he learned, unless he put those 12 suggested steps into his life and made some changes, he could very well lose his sobriety. And I sat up real tall. I put a little smirk on my face because I wanted him to see me because I was sure he was going to say, of course we don't mean that for the little sister there in the third row. <laughs> and the man never said it. And with the help of my sponsor and a few other people, I learned why I was so miserable. I had not changed. Oh, I heard, and I used to say, another one of the cliches, change or die. I used to poke the one next to me and say, isn't there something in between? You know. But do you know that's what it comes down to? That's what it comes down to on this, the most important day of my life? Change or die. You see? Another one of those cliches uh, that used to get to me was, in order to keep what you have, you have to give it away. I used to go into the bathroom and I used to say, in order to keep what you have, you have to give it away. I have a little something, and in order to keep it, I've got to give it to them. Well, you know. But in order to keep it, you have to give it away. Giving is a sign of life. Keeping is a touch of death. And so, little by slowly, I got into our 12 suggested steps. And three major changes started and continue a day at a time for me. The first is the intellectual. 
You see, when I came to you, my thinking was either a one or a ten. Extreme in the thinking. You see. My thinking would fit on a postage stamp. It was so narrow. My thinking went ready, fire, aim. <laughs> and, and we talked about those things. And you said to me, listen, Maurice, take a look at the 12 suggested steps. Little by slowly, you'll be able to make changes. And an intellectual conversion has taken place up here. I got out of my own head. I could see the broader picture. I can allow, give people permission to have their opinion and to see things the way they wish to see them, be respectful of them. Oh, that all happens up here. Intellectual conversion. The moral conversion. My value system went out the window. That bothered me terribly. And you said, hey, listen. You'll be able to put first things first and second things second. And when you're wrong, you'll be able to promptly admit it. And you'll be able to practice the principles in all your affairs. And you'll be able to practice the principles and you won't have affairs. <laughs> and so we've had a, a moral conversion. And then the spiritual. The spiritual came in two ways. First, I had to get a balance with religion. Because I wasn't just Catholic. I had little flags. Catholic, Catholic, very, 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 very Catholic. <laughs> so I was to the extreme with that. And you helped me get a balance. You said our program teaches us about balance in every area. And you helped me get a balance with religion. And then the spiritual. I said, well, what is it? You said, well, it has to do with life and living and love and loving in relationship to God, self, and others. Well, I wanted to have relationships with other folks, and I wanted to get closer to this God now. But what about self? I said, there's nothing here. You said, we'll help you. We'll help you get in touch. And little by slowly, you helped me get in touch with all that God had given me. I believe for a life-giving, healthy spirituality today, the key is a relationship with self. This is the person you bring to the relationship with the other folks. This is the person that sits before God trying to have a relationship. You see, I, I taught little children, love your neighbor as yourself, but I loved, tried to love my neighbor instead of myself. <coughs> see. So I have a life-giving, healthy, meaningful spirituality today. I have a balance with my religion. So I've had a spiritual conversion. And the other major thing that has happened is I still like to sit in the third row, but I sit and I walk very tall today. Because, you know, when God gives the precious gift of sobriety, and I believe it's the same for our friends on the other side of the coin, the beautiful gift of recovery, he says three things. He says, first, I'm interrupting your death. Your work's not finished. Carry a message. Walk with. Pass it on. Help other people take care of their precious gift. Be that fellowship. He says, secondly, you will share relationship with these people. They will come into your life and you will come into theirs in this beautiful fellowship. And he says, third, with this gift of sobriety, this gift of recovery, I give you your dignity. Walk tall. And so my prayer for you is that you'll continue a day at a time to have your sobriety, your recovery, and as a result of that, I know, I just know, you'll have your dignity. I close with a piece from the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. If you haven't found anything thus far to identify with, perhaps you can identify with this. Here I found an ingredient that had been lacking in any other effort I had made to save myself. Here was power. Here was power to live to the end of any given day. Power to have courage to face the next day. Power to have friends. Power to help people. Power to be sane. Power to stay sober. The short version of Maurice's story. Sometime they're going to invite me for the short version. Oh, I'll go anyway. <laughs> I'm sure you'll be able to identify with it as well. But before I pray that, 
I would like to thank you, Rick and Linda, for listening to the tape and giving in my name. And I'd like to thank all the folks who uh, made a contribution to having this marvelous and wonderful spring fling and uh, for inviting me to come. And the short version of Maurice's story, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. And may God, however you understand that God, may God bless you and God bless me and God keep you and God keep me because nobody does it quite as well. Thank you so very much.